Welcome, disciples and devotees of Sri Aurobindo and Mother. Um, we are here with our beloved Ranga um, in our studies with Ranga. And today ev and every Friday, we uh, look into Savitri. So we are now in Book One, the Book of Beginnings, Canto Four the secret knowledge and we are on page 57 so Ranga please begin for us and maybe we can go back a little bit and yeah. just discuss what happened previously I do. in this have you start yes please so in this canto Sri Ranga is saying the secret knowledge which the Yoga of the king, the Ashwapati is slowly realizing all these things. Just one second. Yeah. The yoga of the souls really. So the Ashwapati, so he is experiencing all these things. So what is the secret? So we go back a little bit. I start from the alpha and the omega in one sound. About 10 lines above. Okay. 16 lines above the alpha and the omega in one sound. Okay. So we'll start from there. So the alpha and the omega represent the first letter and the last uh, alphabet in the Greek alphabet. They represent the first and the last letters. Okay. So what really meaning alpha and omega means right from the superconscious to the inconscient. So, the secret knowledge of what? The secret knowledge of the whole thing. The materialist is interested only in the secret of material world. The Mayavada is interested only in the secret of the superconscient, the higher worlds. But Srivana wants the knowledge of both. He wants the Alpha and the Omega. So, this is the uh, context. So, and then he says, then shall the spirit and nature be one. So this is the whole idea of Sri Ramadha's Yoga. He wants to bring down the perfection of the divine into the physical world. The physical world is far from perfect, but he wants to bring down that. That is the yoga of integral yoga. That's the yoga, integral yoga. So now I read the next one and we'll see what he said. Two are the ends of the mysterious plan. Two are the ends. One is the spirit and the other is the matter, nature. Okay. So both are to be found out, the secret of both are to be discovered. In the wide sunless ether of the self, in the unchanging silence, white and nude, aloof, resplendent, like gold dazzling suns, veiled by the ray no mortal eye can bear, the spirit's free and absolute potencies burn in the solitude of the thoughts of God. This whole passage has been marked out by Mother, beginning from in the wide, signless ether up to the thoughts of God. This passage is <coughs> selected by Mother for the painting and music. Okay? And what is it being said? This is the experience of the self and we'll see each word and we'll see how it is, what it corresponds to in the self. This is a poetry, so it's not philosophy but it's poetry. In the wide, signless, so wide means infinite. When you are in that consciousness of the self, it is infinite. Signless, in other words, featureless. There is absolutely no feature. No color, no shape, no size, no weight, no um, feature of any sort. Ether. Ether is the subtlest of substance, which is one everywhere. Pure and one. So that's a self. In the un and the other lines will give you the characteristics of the self. In the unchanging silence, white and new. So first of all, unchanging. It's immutable. It is static. Okay, that's a consciousness that you enter into. It is silent. Nothing is even created there 
and it is absolutely unchanging and it is silent. No words, nothing at all. White and new, new white and new means featureless again. It's only white. There, even white is too much of a description. It is not even white. It is so new. Then aloof. The word aloof suggests that it has nothing to do with the physical world. It is completely cut off. When you are in the Brahmic consciousness of the self, you feel yourself to be outside the universe, outside your body mind life. Okay? And what is that? Resplendent, like gold dazzling suns, veiled by the ray, no mortal eye can bear. Okay? The dazzling suns are above, it's not in the self. The spirits free and absolute potencies burn in the solitude of the thoughts of God. Interesting because I have the word bear and absolute. That's, uh, I also have noted that, but the, what I'm reading is the first version. This yes. Is bear in the but it's interesting to note these things. Okay, so now he's saying the spirit's absolute potencies are burning in the solitude of the thoughts of God. And what are those burning potencies? The next line. A rapture and a radiance and a hush. Okay? The rapture corresponds to ananda. Radiance corresponds to light or chit consciousness. And the hush silence, it is the silence. Uh. Again, this is the expression of the, uh, is an explanation of the description of this featureless self. Okay? Now, Delivered from the approach of wounded hearts, denied to the idea that looks at grief, removed from the force that cries out in its pain, in his inalienable bliss, they lived. So now, when you are wounded in the heart, when you are looking at grief, only at grief, when you are removed, not you, but when the, that consciousness is removed from the force that cries out in pain, you cannot be in the self. That's what he's saying. Okay? <clears throat> and removed from the cries out in pain, in his inalienable bliss, who is the head? His God. Okay? In God's inalienable bliss, they live. Who are the live? They rapture and radiance and hush. Now you understand what he's saying. In other words, when you are in pain and you are in grief, you cannot be in the spirit. You cannot be in the self. When you are in the self, you will be very, very far away from wounded hearts and grief. There will be nothing. In fact, you will have only rapture and radiance and hush. That's the, what he's saying. Okay. Now we go to the next. <laughs> Immaculate in self-knowledge and self-power, calm, they repose on the eternal will. So, immaculate, pure, clean, okay? Immaculate, in self-knowledge and self-power. So, self-knowledge is chit and self-power is shakti. Calm, they repose on the eternal will. Who is the they again? Again, the rapture and the radiance. Okay? They Repose on the eternal will. <coughs> will is again the power, the Shakti. Okay? He is using different words, but he is seeing again and again there is such a the experience. Only his law they count and him obey. So this is the, <coughs> uh, the beginning of what we have to read today. We read the, we, to get the context, we read the earlier part. So, only his law and they count and him obey. Who is the his and him? God. He has referred to earlier in the line, there is the thoughts of God. So, who is counting and obeying him? Ananda and light, rapture and radiance are obeying, they only they count, nothing else. Only God's radiance and God's rapture, they count and they obey only his rapture and radiance, nothing else. They do not obey the pain and the grief and wounded hearts they don't. Okay. They have no goal to reach, 
no aim to serve. Again, the day is radiance and rapture. Okay. In other words, he is actually this. You can call it a, a transferred epithet. Okay. What he is meaning is the self. But like your, this is an interesting a device of grammar. You call it a transferred epithet. What he is meaning is the self. But he is applying the rapture and radiance to self. Okay. You can say, for example, I'll give you an example, then you will understand. You can say. He is courageous sword. Now, the sword is not courageous. Is the man who is manning the sword who is courageous? So this is what is called a transferred epithet. Okay. So Sirmir is doing the same here. He is using the rapture and radiance for the self. Okay. So all that he is saying here is for the self, but is they 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 he is just meaning rapture and radiance. Okay. So there is an interesting device. It's also called a euphemism. In uh, English grammar, you call it euphemism. Transfer epithet. So all these things, when you are there, there is no grief, and you are very far away from any cries of pain. So only His law, God's law, they count, and only they obey God. They have no goal to reach, no aim to serve. They are self-sufficient. There is nothing, no, nothing to be done. Implacable in their timeless purity. Implacable, relentless, unappeasable. That's what it means. Okay. So implacable in their timeless purity. Now, all barter. What is this condition of the self? All barter or bribe or worship they refuse. In other words, if you try to. Please God, okay, and try to get something out of Him, like bribing Him. It will not work. The divine can't be fooled, okay. So that's what He's saying. These, the self is beyond all bribe and beyond all but. You have to approach Him with absolutely a pure consciousness. If you have intentions, it won't work. That's what He's saying. All barter or bribe or worship, they refuse, unmoved. By cry of revolt and ignorant prayer, they reckon not our virtue and our sin. You know, this is an idea which you, when we are in the lower level of the body mind life, sin and virtue make a lot of sense to us, and the dualities are absolutely valid for us at that level. Okay, but when you go to the self, there is nothing. You are beyond grief and pain, and you are only obeying the Divine law. So you will look on the witness self, the Brahman consciousness. The self is the witness self. All the pain and all the uh, wounded hearts that you not affecting you at all. There is a consciousness of the self, the Nirvana consciousness. So it appears as though God is very cruel, but actually this is one aspect of Him. He is just looking at you, and later on in the Uh, later on, he will tell you that this is only one aspect. If you want to help somebody, you have to be absolutely calm and unaffected. Then only you. So this is the consciousness where you are first of all not attached to anything. If you have attachment to something, then you will not be able to help him because your judgment will be coloured. So this. A few lines that we are going to read now is a witness self, where you are not affected by anything, neither the sorrow nor the pleasure. Okay, immaculate in self knowledge and self power, calm they repose on the eternal will. They they is the radiance and rapture, radiance and rapture. If you want, okay, the two word which he has used earlier. They have no goal to reach. There is no aim. There is no purpose. There is no motive. There, no aim to serve. Implacable in their timeless will. He is going on using the word "they," but actually he is meaning the self. Okay, that's what we said. All barter or bribe or worship they refuse. You can't win God over with bribes of worship or anything else that you want to give. Okay? He will not be moved. He is unmoved by cry of revolt. And ignorant prayer, he is absolutely implacable. He is just looking on calmly because 
the divine can help you only if he is absolutely unaffected by anything. So there is a consciousness where you are not affected by anything at all. They reckon not our virtue and our sin. When you go to the level two of this, when you go to that level, you are not affected by anything at all. You are absolutely calm, okay? unmoved by cry of revolt and ignorant prayer. They reckon not our virtue and our sin. Virtue and sin are only available at the lower level of the ignorance. At the self, the level two of the self, these things are not at all valid. They disappear. They go into one continuous, um, uh, one continuous uh, stretch. Virtue and sin actually join. They are at the same level. The two ends. Virtue is one end. Sin is at the other end. But it is the same. There is no difference between the two. Vibration of virtue and sin are the same. There is no superior on negative. Negative and positive is not there. They bend not to the voices that implore. So, it seems that God is very cruel. He is not doing anything. In the beginning, it feels like that. If you are in this consciousness, you are absolutely not moved by anything. They hold no track. Again, the they, they, they is re representing the self. Okay? The Brahmic consciousness. <clears throat> they hold no traffic with error and its rain. So they are not affected by error also. There is no error there at all. They are guardians of the silence of the truth. It's absolutely silence. He is repeating the word silence. There is no action there at all. It is immutable. They are keepers of the immutable decree. Immutable, again, you're saying, he's saying that there's no movement there at all in the, no movement, no emotion, nothing. Just a witness self. You are just looking and seeing the things exactly as they are. Now, a deep surrender is a source of might. So, if you surrender, then you can approach these radiance and light. Okay? The radiance and Rapture. You can get only if you surrender. Then a still identity, their way to know. So if you want to know radiance and a rapture or God, if you want to know, you have to identify yourself with that. That's the only way. Motionless in their action, like a sleep, at peace, regarding the trouble beneath the stars. Okay, beneath the stars is the physical world. The all the trouble that you see there, okay? But you are in the motionless, you are at peace, you are regarding. The word regarding is looking at impassively, okay? The witness self, deathless, watching the works of death and chance. Death and chance are at the level one of the ignorance, but you are only watching them. You are not affected at all. You are at peace, you are motionless. Immobile. Seeing the millenniums pass. So, what are the millenniums? Time. The consciousness of the self is timeless. So, from the timeless heights, you are watching the shallow valleys and the depths you are watching, but time is there. Okay, time and movement. Untouched. You are in the self and you are untouched by the long map of fate unrolls. The interesting image is like your Fate, in the beginning, it is unrolling and revealing itself to you. It is like a map that is folded up or rolled up. It is being unrolled. So, mm. you, when you are there at that higher level, the your map of fate is being unrolled. You come to know what your fate is. Okay, That's what it is. <laughs> then, we go to the next day. They look on our struggle with impartial eyes. The they again is rapture and radiance and that they represent the self. So the self is looking on our struggle but not sympathizing with you. They are just neither sympathy nor rejection. Impartial eyes. There is a perfect description of the self okay, where you are not affected. So you can interpret it as cruelty of the divine but you can also interpret it as wanting to help but to help, you must know the exact nature of something. And the exact nature of something can be understood only 
if you are impartial without being any attachment there should be no attachment and then the divine will later on the doctor i'm going to read you will see that there is the divine does help but when you are in that consciousness you don't feel that help you feel yourself to be alone and just watching everything without any judgment okay they look on our struggle with impartial eyes and yet without them cosmos could not be now this is interesting we say it is harking back to the taittiriya upanishad the world cannot exist without the self that's what it means okay them is again radiance and rapture radiance and rapture again chit shakti ananda sat chit shakti ananda without sat chit shakti ananda the world cannot exist that's what he said without them although it seems to be totally cut off from each other okay you are only watching there is no connection between spirit and matter there is no connection you are just watching but the world cannot exist without that okay and there is a suggestion of that in the taittiri upanishad where they say it is ananda that creates the world and it is ananda by which everything in the world lives and exists and to ananda they return when they are born they breathe live and then finally pass back into ananda again so that's exactly the what is interesting in modern different worlds and yet without them them is the rapture and radiance cosmic cosmos could not be the world is dependent on the self <laughs> impervious to desire and doom and hope okay impervious you cannot be affected that's what it means impervious to desire and doom and hope that means your desire and doom and hope and all these things will not touch the self consciousness of the self the station of inviolable might okay so now he is talking also of the power that is it the station of inviolable might moveless again the suggestion of static condition upholds the world's enormous task so from the silence is coming out the movement okay that's what he said its ignorance is by their knowledge lit its ignorance the world okay he is using the word cosmos so or the world moveless upholds the world's enormous task its ignorance the world's ignorance is by their knowledge who is the they again radiance and rapture so it is the ignorance of the world is being enlightened by the self that's what it meant its yearning lasts by their indifference okay the <coughs> this is an interesting uh, line and we have to understand this way. their indifference the self is indifferent to the prayers and the uh, demands of the physical world okay and the non response actually breeds intensity of aspiration when you pray to someone and he is not responding to you your earning becomes even more intense okay that's what he meaning okay if you pray to god and you don't seem to get a response you pray even harder okay so that's what is meaning here it's yearning the world's yearning or cosmos yearning lasts by their indifference they don't seem to be responding to you the self is not responding as the height draws the low ever to climb as the height draws the low ever to climb it is actually putting it up okay as the breaths draw the small to adventure vast their aloofness drives man to surpass himself so the so called cruelty and non responsive attitude of the divine in the self is actually helping you <laughs> that's what he say their aloofness drives man to surpass himself it seems to be unreachable but he is actually helping you to reach it by denying try more try more try more that's it uh, the suggestion being given okay. 
Their aloofness drives man to surpass himself. Our passion heaves to wed the eternal calm. The human uh, aspiration is heaving, it is lifting up, hauling itself up with effort okay, to wed the eternal calm. The aspiration of man wants to go up and it helps when the, you are challenged. That's the suggestion being made. Our passion, our desire to reach the divine is actually helping us to go upwards. Heaving is lifting, hauling heavy things with effort. Okay? So it is actually helping you to go up, to wed, to join with the eternal calm. We are in the movement and the pain and the suffering and the eternal calm there is free of pain and suffering. So we are making an effort to go up to there and become one with them, to wed. He is using again a, an image. Okay? We have to become one with that. Our dwarf search. I go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Our dwarf search mind. Okay, dwarf search is an adjective to mind to meet the omniscience force. It is helping. The impassiveness of the self is helping our passion to go to the eternal calm, and our very limited mind. It is helping to meet the Omniscience force. Okay. That's what it means. Yeah, one time I, I asked Nolini to, to define the dwarf search mind. And he says, mind is already searching, bubbling, but the bubbling is that of a dwarf. A dwarf, when he walks, is not elegant, is ungainly as the mind's movements. Okay, yeah. Dwarf search mind. The searching of the mind is a very dwarfish. It yes. is very small. It is ignorant. Yeah. That's what he said. Okay. Acquiescing in the wisdom that made hell and the harsh utility of death and tears. Acquiescing in the gradual steps of time. Careless they seem of the grief that stings the world's heart. Again, there is the experience of the self. He is explaining how apparently they seem to be careless. Actually, later on you will see that the divine does help, but you are not seeing that. Okay. So, uh, what does the word acquiesce mean? Acquiesce means to agree a little reluctantly. In other words, the wisdom that made help. Okay. Why did God create the physical world with all its suffering? So, you have to accept that in the beginning. Okay, so you accept that wisdom that may help and the harsh utility of death and tears. This is a problem in, in the life divine where you dealt with great detail that the negatives, the all the suffering, pain, evil, falsehood, these are the they have their function in the world. They help you to go beyond. These they have no value at the animal level, but at the human level. When you see evil, you want to go beyond it. When you see suffering, you want to go beyond suffering. So, they have a function in the world. That's what he's saying. Careless they seem to the grief that stings, of, that stings the world's heart. Careless of the pain that rends its body and life. Above joy and sorrow is that grandeur is born. It is neither affected by joy nor by sorrow. Grandeur is what? You are actually, they use the word grandeur. You are free. You feel yourself to be infinite. You are not affected by anything. And that's grand. Okay. They have no portion in the good that dies. They, now, this is interesting. Even the good can die. Okay. At our human level, when an evil dies, you are happy. But when a good dies, you feel, feel, feel that to be a mystery. Why is a good dying? Okay. But this consciousness of the self, not affected by all these things at all, because there is a reason behind all this. They have no portion in the good that dies. It's far above all these things, good and bad. Mute, pure, they share not in the evil done. Okay. The radiance, the Satchitananda, 
is far above the evil being done in the world. There is nothing common to them. It is beyond good and evil. All the dualities. That's what is meant. Okay. The entire passage is a description of the self, where it is you are absolutely immutable, calm, peaceful, not affected by anything. You are just watching the sufferings and the evil in the world, and you are not attributing any qualitative um, virtues to them. You are just seeing them as they are. You see blue and red. Just as impartially, you are seeing. You don't say that blue is superior to red. Okay, good and evil are all at the same level. You are just watching calmly and peacefully. This is the first thing. <coughs> in other words, there is a chapter in uh, synthesis. The standards of conduct. Okay. You have to go beyond good and evil. You have to go beyond morality. And when you go beyond morality, the evil and the good don't affect you at all. The evil, suffering, good, all these things don't affect you at all. Even good doesn't bother you because you have gone beyond all these things. They have no portion in the good that dies. Mute, pure, they share not in the evil time. Okay? They are above these things. Neither the good. Not the evil. Else might their strength be marred and could not save. There you are. If you start taking sides, okay, you take the side of good and you reject the evil. You are not being absolutely objective. You are not being. You are taking sides, and if you take sides, you are affected. And you, for being uh, helpful, you have to be absolutely beyond all these things so that you can really help. You see the reason for suffering, and then help. That's what he's saying. They have no mute pure. They share not in the evil done, nor in the good. The both of them, you are free of them. Else might their strength be marred and could not save. Who is their strength? Again, radiance and rapture. So their strength lies in being absolutely objective and without being affected by anything. Okay, alive to the truth. That dwells in God's extremes, the two poles. Okay, God's extremes. One is the superconscious, and the other is the inconscient. <clears throat> so, or you can say God and the spirit and matter. Okay, alive to the truth that dwells in God's extremes. When you are in the physical world, you don't see that the superconscious and the inconscient are both God's creations. And you think that one is bad and one is good, good and evil. But here, when you are the the truth that there is a truth in both, okay, in the superconscious and the uh, the inconscious, there is a truth there. That's what you have to get. That's the entire idea in the integral yoga. You have to get the truth of both. Awake to the motion of that all-seeing force, all-seeing force. Look at the words. All seeing, conscious force, shakti. So all seeing force is using the words. It means chit shakti, chit shakti of the satchidananda, okay. the slow venture of the long ambiguous years, and the unexpected good from woeful deeds. This is the law of causality that is coming in. The slow venture of the long ambiguous years. You have had many many lives, long ambiguous years. And the unexpected good from woeful deeds. Now that's very interesting line. We'll have to look at that. Same so says in the Life Divine that good can engender evil, and evil, so-called evil, can engender good. Okay. If you see in the physical world, you will see that there is duality. There are always there. Suppose very simple examples we can take. Take a river in flood. Okay. It floods. And there is devastation. Okay, that's bad so far as we are concerned. But the <clears throat> when the waters withdraw, it has made the soil fertile. Okay, so there is good and bad in everything. Take also the British conquest of India. Okay, how the so they came in with intentions of conquering and looting. Okay, 
So that's a bad part. But when they withdrew, they left the an administrative system. They also built the railways. They also gave you a form of government which is modern. So there's a mixture of both. So they were simply saying, good can engender evil, and evil can engender good also. So this how you do it. But often you they are interchangeable also. So another example for good. Okay, you are being virtuous, but with a wrong notion. Okay, so I'll give you an example for this. You know that somebody has done something wrong, and the authorities are asking, "Who has done this?" So you tell the truth. Now, truth is good. You tell that such and such a person has done it, but your intention is evil. You want that man to suffer. So you can see how there is a mixture of both these things. So that's exactly what he's saying here. Good can bring evil, and evil also can offer end in good. Okay, so the evil of colonialism has done a lot of good to the countries where they colonized, which they colonized. So that's what he's saying here. So you can give examples to yourself. You understand what he's saying. Okay, <clears throat> the slow venture of long ambiguous year. And the unexpected good from woeful deeds, you can see it from another point of view also. All your suffering and all your pain, is it only negative? No, it also gives you a desire to go beyond it. So this pain and suffering also is pushing you towards a painlessness. Okay, so that also you can see in that. The immortal sees not as we vainly see. We see good and evil. We see pain and pleasure, but the divine doesn't see that. He is far above that, and he is seeing that both are interchangeable. I have the immortal. You have immortal. Where? The immortal sees not. The immortal sees not as we vainly see. The immortal yeah. is God, or also you can say such an another. Okay. So such a one does not see all these things. They don't see good and bad. They don't at all take those into uh, the uh, their view of things. Now he looks on hidden aspects and screened powers. Now he is talking of God. The he, he he several times the he will come. That is God. Okay, he has referred to it five six lines above. Alive to the truth that dwells in God's extremes, okay. So He, God, looks on hidden aspects and screened powers. He knows the law and the natural line of things. He is not affected by good and evil. All these things are not affecting him. Undriven by a brief life's will to act, unharassed by the spur of pity and fear, He makes no haste to untie the cosmic knot. So again, description of the self. He is in no hurry to help you come out of pain and suffering. Why? Because that also has got a purpose. The more pain you have, the more you will want to come out of it. That's a spur. That's a goad for you. So he looks on all these things without being affected. The whole paragraph here, the whole section that we have seen, description of the self, where it seems to be. That God is not affected by all these things; He is cruel and not at all bothered about what's going on in the world. But that's only one aspect. That's not true because there is a purpose in pain and suffering. That's what He said. Undriven, God is not affected at all by brief life's will to act. Unharassed, He is not bothered at all by the spur of pity and fear. He makes no haste to untie the cosmic knot. There is a slow movement upwards, okay? Because it's very detailed. It's not something fast. It happens very slowly. He makes no haste to untie the cosmic knot, or the world's torn, jarring heart to reconcile. These two lines suggest that evolution is very slow in the individual as well as in the universe. In time, he waits for the eternal hour. So. He is very patient. He is not in a hurry. Okay, that's what he says. He waits for the eternal hour. The eternal hour is the point in which 
you will cross suffering and pain and go into a condition where you will be free of pain and suffering this is eternal sorrow yet a spiritual secret aid is there now he comes that all that you saw that god is not helping you actually he is helping you now you start seeing that he is helping you. yet a spiritual secret aid is there even the suffering that you are it's an aid to you okay you start realizing that okay. yet a spiritual secret aid is there while a tardy evolution evolutions coils wind on okay so although god doesn't seem to be helping you he is helping you he is helping you through even the negatives he is pushing you towards that which is the good <clears throat> While a tardy evolution coils, now do do look at the word coils. Tardy evolution coils. Evolution is not linear. Okay, so how much Sri Ramana packs into each word and each sentence? The evolution is spiral. Okay, it goes up and down, up and down. That's why you use the word coil. It goes on coming, but the evolution is going ultimately upwards. But it seems to go down, come up. Seems to go down, come up. it is spiral in nature and nature hews her way through adamant and nature hews her way through adamant okay adamant again unwilling refusing so nature is refusing the light from above seems to be and yet nature is hewing her way there is a progress slow progress that happens not the word hew or way digging and cutting so it's a very slow progress that happens nature hews her way through adamant a divine intervention thrones above so but you felt that there is no help coming it is there okay and the word thrones above is very interesting he has used the noun as a verb seated above okay it's an intransitive verb he is thrones above a divine intervention so there is an intervention divine intervention above which is helping you but you are not conscious of it sometime you start realizing that the divine help is there alive in a dead rotating universe we were not here upon a casual globe abandoned to a task beyond our force even through the tangled anarchy called fate and through the bitterness of death and fall an outstretched hand is felt upon our lives so it's time now so we'll just stop here so what he's saying is that there is a purpose in this creation of the world it's not a casual glow there's a purpose it's not that it is come into chance by chance casually it has come but there is a purpose in life that's what he said so we have to stop here today i actually normally in the past nara you used to do, read a passage and then we used to go through it i completely forgot about that so okay. i did the whole thing so next time you will read a passage and we'll look at it okay good good and for ancient method <laughs> very good okay excellent ranga thank you so much